Good evening, everyone. Welcome to our 30th virtual shadowing session, Burnout in Medicine with Dr. Courtney. If you have any questions regarding our program, please feel free to reach out to us on our Instagram at virtual shadowing or email us at virtual shadowing at gmail.com. This session will be recorded and posted on our YouTube channel, Free Health Virtual Shadowing. Next, please. Be sure to tune in for our upcoming sessions. We have travel and wilderness medicine, a specialty spotlight in OB-GYN, and then a PA spotlight in infectious diseases. All of those sessions will be on Tuesdays at 7 p.m. Central Standard Time on Zoom or YouTube Live. Next, please. These sessions are brought to you by our wonderful working group um, made of Reagan, Shayan, Taylor, Alana, Rachel, Aniruth, Miriam, Rohit, and our three uh, physicians, Dr. Fowler, Dr. Morchetti, and Dr. Salazar. Uh, Dr. Fowler, can you uh, actually hold on next slide? <laughs> and then if you have any questions in the chat, please, or uh, if you have any questions, please put them in the chat. Uh, we will have two designated portions for questions. Our team will be taking all the questions and we will rank them and ask them to Dr. Courtney. Um, if you have any questions about the assessment, please wait until the very end. And then Dr. Fowler, can you now introduce our wonderful uh, speaker for tonight? Thank you, Rachel and uh, Mark. Let's have the next slide so I can, uh, <laughs> so I can introduce you. Um, folks, all 600 of you that are out there right now, uh, this is perhaps the most important talk we've done so far out of the 50 hours that we put out there in the 30 sessions. <clears throat> Understanding who you are going to be a few years from now, you, you, could, you, could, you could be going down any path and not really understanding it, recognizing it. One of my dear friends, Compton Broders, a uh, wonderful, wonderful emergency physician, retired now, said this. He said that burnout is the response of a normal person to a toxic environment. Tonight, we're going to talk about your future. And this is a no holes barred discussion about the things that you are gonna be seeing from the electronic medical record to control of your hours as you work in the office or in the hospital, how different kinds of specialties react to different kinds of stresses. And as we go along on this, I want you to really ask yourself, is this really what you plan to do? I think that what we've done all along here at Virtual Shadowing, now that with our some almost 36,000 people that have signed up in the last 10 months for these now 30 sessions, is to try to present to you a very honest feel for what medicine is like by people who do it for a living. Tonight, I am just delighted to introduce a dear, dear friend. Uh, this is Dr. Mark Courtney. Mark um, came out of uh, Arizona State University where he majored in zoology. He then went to the Baylor College of Medicine in Houston. He was, uh, he was AOA awarded in 1997, the highest award that a medical student can receive for excellence. He then went on to the Carolinas Medical Center uh, where he did emergency medicine where he received the resident research award. Mark went on then to do a research fellowship in 2001 at the Carolinas Medical Center. Interestingly, he investigated the etiology and the clinical presentation of sudden death from pulmonary embolism, which is blood clots to the lungs in both animals and humans. He was one of the first folks to look into this issue to try to understand the issue of sudden death and pulmonary emboli. He went on then to be a faculty member of emergency medicine at Northwestern University from 2001 until 2019, where he then went on to get his master's of science in clinical investigation at Northwestern University in 2009. We were then able to steal him away to UT Southwestern Department of Emergency Medicine, where he joined our faculty uh, as the executive vice chairman of academic affairs at University of Texas Southwestern Department of Emergency Medicine since September of 2019. Mark, it is an absolute delight to have you with us. And we just, we're sitting here just looking so much forward to hearing what you have to say for us this evening. Excellent. Um, thank you very, very much, um, Dr. Fowler. And my thanks also go to, to 
uh, Rachel, the, the rest of the student and pre-medical team, and uh, also Dr. Salazar and Dr. Morchetti for their leadership in putting this together. I also want to thank all of you for just taking your time to listen to this. Um, I, I really think this is an important topic. It's a fun topic to talk to. It is um, the most important topic that comes up when I'm not talking about science or blood clots with people. It's a topic I discuss with you know people from the whole entire spectrum of you know, college, high school, all the way up into, you know, medical school and residence. And we're going to dig into kind of how, how you find meaning in, in work and how that fits into finding meaning in life. And um, hopefully you're going to come, come away with some tools. I, I, you know, I really wish the topic that the, the top title was not pure, you know, kind of burnout, because we're going to go way beyond burnout. We're going to talk about, you know, well-being itself. We're going to talk about tools to insulate yourself. From burnout, but but I think it's really important for you to understand what these terms mean, what's in the news, what some doctors may be may be feeling or reporting, um, and and be able to kind of make sense of that. Um, so I, I really appreciate it. I would urge you to tell some of your colleagues who um, you know may um, be on this this uh, group in listserv to check it out on YouTube. Because um, I know it's it's coming before the holidays, and you got a lot of other things to be doing than spending you know this amount of time on, at night um, with me with us. But I appreciate you for doing so. Um, I think it it comes off as being a little bit better live, um, but um, but I think the YouTube version is going to be great. So you know my story has been pretty well documented by Dr. Fowler, and and I'm going to kind of skip over it briefly because I think you guys have had a lot of talks on why I went into medicine or why I chose to do what I'm doing. Um, so I'm not going to go into a ton of details on that, but it is going to be a little bit important because one of the questions, I'm not going to tell you which, but one of the questions that might show up on your, you know, exam for, for this session for credit is going to be related to this particular slide. Um, but I was born in Kansas City, Missouri, and uh, at the, quote, research hospital there. I have no idea what they were researching at all, but somehow or another, that's where I was born in 1969, a long time ago. I was born December 30th, so... Um, I actually was born on that day because um, my dad, I guess, was, you know, discussing with the obstetric doctor who, you know, had an upcoming trip and wanting to go pheasant hunting and, you know, somehow or another back in those days, um, boom, I got induced before, uh, before, before uh, the 70s. So I'm proud to be a child of the 60s, although only really by a day. Um, my dad was a, a P, he got a PhD in early childhood education from Kansas State University. So we moved to Manhattan, Kansas. And I grew up listening to my dad talk about Piaget, one of the fathers of educational psychology. And he talked about him so much that I actually thought that Piaget was like one of my dad's friends that he hung out with at the bar, um, but not so. You know, then he's got to get a job. So we move up to Mayville, North Dakota, teeny tiny town. It's like 5,000 people. I grew up in fear that I was going to be the only kid wearing a snowmobile suit when I went to school, you know, in April, because as it got warmer and warmer and warmer, people would just stop wearing their snowmobile suits. My mom made me wear mine over and over and over again. And so I grew up a little bit as a kind of a shy, quiet kid, really a little bit worried about what people thought of me. Um, again, both of my parents were teachers. My mom says, we're going to move. We've got to get out of this cold. We're going to go somewhere warm. So we move of all places to Iowa. Um, eventually then my mom says, no, we're definitely getting out of here. We go to Arizona, um, where most of my family still is. Uh, my mom lives there. My dad's passed away. Um, and my brother's there as an emergency medicine doctor. So home for me really is Arizona. I went to high school and college there, um, and then went to, um, went to Baylor, um, in Houston, Texas. Um, I am not a Houston Astros fan, but I lived at, uh, 7950 North Stadium Drive, just north of the Astrodome. Um, and was, was there and really had an outstanding time in, in medical school. Some of the best friends I met were in medical school. I left college and I didn't think that I would ever make as good of friends as I did. And then boom, I did. Carolina's Medical Center, same thing. I met some of the best friends I've ever made in my life in residency. Um, it's in Charlotte, North Carolina, and it was a great place to learn emergency medicine. Um, not really big and affiliated with the gigantic medical school, but one of the best like integrated, busy places to learn comprehensive emergency medicine. And then at some point, my research mentor said, you gotta get out of here, you gotta go somewhere else, you gotta, gotta go someplace where you know, you're gonna grow something on your own, start something on your own. And I went to Chicago and worked at Northwestern University. I had a job where I provided game day service for the Chicago Cubs. I lived about two blocks from um, Wrigley Field. I could take my daughter, Katie Courtney, who may be listening tonight. I don't know. It's also possible she's watching The Bachelorette 
um, finale. So we'll, we'll see, I'll quiz her on this and we'll see whether she's watching. She's an undergraduate at University of Arizona interested in some form of medicine. Um, but I would walk her to Wrigley Field and we'd knock on the door, walk in and sit down and get you know these great seats behind home plate and be able to just you know take in the game. That's kind of what she thought baseball was all about. So yeah, I'm, I'm pretty much a fan of what is without a doubt the best baseball team in the world, the Chicago Cubs. Um, and then ended up coming here not too long, you know, I mean, basically just a year and a half ago, incredibly happy to be here in, in Dallas as part of the UT Southwestern team. Um, so very, very happy to be here, especially, um, you know, in the last you know, year or so in, in this experience with COVID, I, I have been extraordinarily impressed with my colleagues, our trainees, our students, our residents, our nurses, the entire team. So why emergency medicine? Bottom line is I just got bored with the operating room. I mean, you see this person over here falling asleep. I mean, that could be me. I got bored in internal medicine, listening to people drone on and on and on. That could be me. And I wanted to take care of everything that was in the back of this ambulance. I'd see an ambulance go by and I'd be like, you know what? I want to take care of whatever is in the back of that. You know, that's where my attention was. I really didn't have enough focus. I found myself really interested in the first hour or two of everything, but not much beyond that. Um, I don't know if any of you guys know who this is. I know one person on this call does. Maybe Dr. Salazar and Dr. Morchetti do. I, I'm sure that they do. I'm sure that they do. But um, you guys may not know that there's actually somebody here who has an emergency um, TV show lunchbox, and that's Dr. Fowler. So I think he was wearing, you know, holding this the first day I met him. Um, and uh, I was amazed that somebody had this because I recall having this exact same thing when I was a kid. But it was one of the early TV shows. Um, that really popularized, um, you know, acute care, emergency care, on-demand care um, in Los Angeles. Johnny and Roy, Johnny Gage, Roy DeSoto, I think was their names. Um, and my brother and I used to play Johnny and Roy when we were, we were kids, so. Um, uh, Mark, you need to know that uh, Brandon Morchetti also has an emergency lunchbox. <laughs> well, yeah, of course he, of course he does. Absolutely. Um, uh, what's most important is not whether you have the lunchbox, but it's what you put in the lunchbox. I think I've seen Morchetti put like PB and J's or crustables or uncrustables or something like that, right? And uh, yes, and um, uh, Red Bull and apple slices. And a Red Bull will will uh, will carry you very far, very far. So, yeah, you know, I I think that's kind of the the scoop with. Um, you know, with kind of how I got interested in emergency medicine. Um, I'm going to give you guys now a free interview tip, okay? Um, these are things I ask nearly all applicants for medical school or residency and have done so for many, many years. Um, so I would urge you to think about these. You might even want to write them down. You might even want to take a screenshot. Um, because a lot of times what happens is you go and you interview for something and it's like, why do you want to go into medicine? And the answer is, well, because um, I like to help people. That's fine, but you can help people doing a lot of things. You could help people by being a social worker. You could help people by being um, a teacher. You could help people by being a psychologist. You could help people by, you know, a lot of stuff that has nothing to do with medicine. So why medicine? Think about that. Um, these are all questions that I, I will ask, you know, um, have you faced adversity? What do you think it's going to be like working 10, 20 years from now? And that's kind of gets at this topic we're going to talk about tonight. And then this is really critical. What do you think the most difficult thing will be that you will have to deal with when you are a doctor in the future or a PA or a nurse practitioner or a PT or a, um, a physician assistant or um, a nurse? It, it, it doesn't matter what you fill in here, but what do you think is going to be the most difficult thing you're going to face? And when I find that nobody has an answer to that, I find them to be lacking in maturity. I find them to not have a good picture of what they're getting into. Now, shadowing helps that. Being in an emergency space or being in a medical space or seeing what care is like helps prepare you to answer that question. Um, but you have to answer it yourself. Um, it has to be your own personal answer based on what you've thought through and what you've observed. Um, and certainly the problem of burnout in medicine is a problem that you should think a little bit about. Um, this is one way that you can help prepare for, um, for that, that question. So um, we're going to talk a little bit about well-being and burnout, and we're going to do it because I think it is important no matter what you go into. If you go into any of those things over there on the screen, I think you are somebody who's going to have to ask yourself, what do you do to be insulated from burnout? Or how do you achieve well-being? How do you find meaning in your chosen field in medicine? Um, and I know there's a lot of folks on this group who are not going necessarily to be doctors. That's awesome. That's great. 
um, I still think this is an important topic for you. So we're gonna understand the complexity of this topic. We're gonna think about what it means, how it's measured, um, because it does mean some specific things. Um, when you read an article, I want you to know where that comes from in terms of what burnout is. It's not just being sad or being unhappy. Um, I want you to know some of the drivers and causes of this, both personally as well as the health system. And I wanna let you kind of think about some action items that you can even start now to try to kind of mitigate the likelihood that you will find yourself suffering or feeling some burnout. Um, so this is a quote, New York Times 2012. This is, you know, eight years ago, a significant portion of doctors feel trapped, limited by limited time they are allowed to spend with patients, ever-changing rules set by insurers, gains in efficiency by electronic medical records offset by numerous newly devised administrative tasks. And then um, it goes on and says, doctors who are suffering from burnout are more prone to errors, less empathic, more prone to treat patients like diagnoses or objects, also more likely to quit practicing altogether. So this is a great article. You might want to reference it. You might want to read it. New York Times, author is Chen, 2012. Um, there's some great stuff to dig into there. Um, so it costs a lot of things to the healthcare system because everybody who leaves medicine, they have to hire, recruit, and train new people. Even the people who stay that are really suffering from burnout are less efficient, less productive. Um, there's statistically significant links to patient satisfaction associated with, with problems with burnout. And then the cost to the clinicians is, is really even worse. And, and it is true. Um, there is higher rates of depression and substance abuse, divorce, and suicide among physicians compared to the general public. Um, I'm not sure what it is, you know, re with respect to nurses, PAs, um, you know, pharmacists, physical therapy, et cetera, et cetera. But um, th these are these are challenges that folks in medicine feel um, more so. Now, that being said, I'm going to tell you that I would do every single thing over again. I'm extraordinarily happy with my choice of field and my work. Um, I will tell you that I've made some deliberate decisions to try to make sure that I find meaning, including being in a teaching setting, in part because my parents were teachers. Um, but I would do it all over again. I know you've had some people lecture and do talks about how hard and how difficult the path is or how hard and how difficult, you know, the practice is, um, you know, challenging clinical situations, but I'm here to tell you, I would do every single thing all over again. But I'm also here to tell you that I probably suffered from some signs of burnout two or three or four years ago too, in terms of how I was thinking through a shift. So what does burnout really mean? And is it really all that bad? Now, I want you to think a little bit about this because there are two things that really kind of constitute what burnout is. This is a paper that if anybody really wants to do a deep dive on, you can check out. Again, this is 2012, about eight years ago, because that's when this topic started to really just kind of hit, um, you know, hit the press and, and people started paying attention to it. And it started by some doctors doing this survey with this thing called the Maslock Burnout Inventory, which is 22 questions and it asks some things and it found significant differences in burnout by specialty and also significant more burnout in physicians compared to the general public. And this is kind of what, what they found. So this is the mean burnout for all physicians participating. It was about 45%. So 45% screened positive for burnout. And I'm gonna tell you what that means in a little bit, but that's a pretty staggering number at the time. You'll also see that emergency medicine here was number one. Woohoo! we're number one. We'll dig into this a little bit later. The author is Shanna Felt probably the most prolific author in the US on this topic of burnout in medicine, um, now works at Stanford, used to be at Mayo, and is doing some things to try and innovate now at Stanford to address these problems. But let's dig into this. How would they measure this in this study? What else could matter? Whenever you guys see research on anything, whether it's research on burnout, whether it's research on blood clots or COVID or um, heart attacks, doesn't matter. You should ask yourself what's being measured. That's the key to everything. And does it matter? So we'll talk a little bit about that. Um, this is a table. This is some, some data from that. And what I'm going to tell you, and again, this is probably one of the most important parts of the talk, might show up on exam. I don't know. But um, they measured two major components. And if you screen positive for either of these two things, you are considered to be positive for burnout. One is emotional exhaustion. The second is depersonalization. Depersonalization is thinking about others in a callous manner, thinking about others as objects, thinking about others as, as a diagnosis, not seeing maybe the humanness in these patients and seeing them more as just tasks to get done, things that you must do to clock in and clock out. 
Um, so again, the two most important components of burnout that really is the mo one of the most important take home messages of this entire lecture is emotional exhaustion and depersonalization. And yes, lo and behold, 45% 2012 screen positive, right? Again, emergency medicine being at the top, um, emotional exhaustion, depersonalization. But it's important to remember that in this study, there was only 333 emergency doctors. And that really only was 4.6% of the sample. So you might say, well, this is one study. Maybe this isn't really true. And if we redid this study a year or two later, it would be different. Um, maybe. You might also say, well, okay, what about work-life balance? Because I've heard a lot of people like to go into emergency medicine because they like to kayak or they like to have time with their family or they like to parachute or they like to do woodworking or who knows what. Um, so what about work-life balance? Now it turns out for work-life balance, emergency medicine is not that bad. We actually score pretty good in terms of satisfaction with work leaves enough time for personal or family life because that's what's being measured over here on the, on the, on the um, x-axis. Um, what about later? So they repeated this study and unfortunately, lo and behold, emergency medicine is still number one up here. And in fact, the, the, the difference between burnout and physicians and the general population was even wider. And the number now is 54%. That's an important number too for you to know, just you know, from the standpoint of what you might wanna take away from, from this. Um, is just what is the proportion in research studies of physicians who report burnout? And it's on average now we're looking at probably between, you know, 45, 50%. Not 100%, not 90%, not zero, not 10, about 50%. So something to think about. Now, let's look at this and deep dive on it a little bit. This is a really interesting slide. So this is the percent who, you know, would report being burned out over here on the x-axis. And then this is the percent satisfied with work-life balance. So who say, you know what, I have enough time for my life, my family, my hobbies, my pursuits. And, and let's see where these specialties are. So emergency medicine, yeah, we're, we're kind of high on the burnout, but we're pretty high on work-life balance. Okay, that's interesting. So it was dermatology. I don't know why. I'm not sure why dermatologists would be particularly burnt out, but um, I suck at, you know, dermatology questions in the emergency department. I'm really, really bad at them. I, I you know, tough, tough for me. That's not my thing. Um, so I think you'd have to ask some dermatologists their feelings about that. Interesting neurosurgery, um, man, they're not burned out, but they do not have much, you know, work-life balance. And, and that kind of makes sense. I mean, they are working, 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 working hours, 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 on call, on call, on call. But man, they find it very fulfilling. I mean, they are in people's brains doing meaningful stuff. Um, psychiatry, strangely enough, it's in the green, you know, pretty low burnout, pretty high work-life balance. In fact, psychiatry turns out to be one of the highest growing sought after specialty fields in medicine right now. I don't know my thoughts on that, but it's interesting. And then a lot of other stuff gets lumped down here, family medicine, general internal medicine, neurology, maybe because reimbursement is lower in these, pressure for time is high in these, um, you know, not sure, but, but this is an interesting thing. Now, this publication is five years old. This is just one study. Absolutely do not use this to plot your career. Do not, do not. But understand that there's a difference between burnout and work-life balance. And think about what factors are most important to you in some ways too. So a really important kind of, kind of concept. Um, we're gonna talk a little bit about the fact that wellness does not mean yoga. Um, this is me. I kind of like to do headstands in various places when I travel. This is at a CME conference that I happen to go to and, and do some lectures on blood clots. Um, you know, so satisfaction with work-life balance does not equal absence of burnout. You still can feel some burnout, feel emotionally exhausted when you go to shifts and when you show up and when you finish your shifts, but go home and have two days off and, you know, pursue your, your family and your hobbies and, and, and feel like you have work-life balance. Okay. Um, these are some other terms you'll hear, you know, fulfillment, happiness, meaningful, self-worth, wellness is kind of the absence of burnout, but it's more than that. It's, it's values and behaviors that promote self-care, growth, compassion for yourself, colleagues, and patients. And then resilience is something you'll hear a lot of people in education of, of um, medicine talking about, which is we need to recruit resilient people in medicine, um, skills, behaviors, and attitudes that contribute to physical, emotional, professional well-being. Um, I don't know how you recruit for this. I don't know how you train for this. I don't know how you develop this, but um, I, I think it is a little bit of a buzzword that we're going to continue to see. So again, burnout equals emotional exhaustion, depersonalization. This is the model at Stanford. And, and I think it's important just to realize that burnout is not all about just 
you, your, your personal resilience, but it's also the institution and whether they have a culture of wellness, what the practice looks like in terms of efficiency. We'll get into this a little bit more. I don't think there's a whole lot else to, to go into um, on this. Just realize that institutions are trying to think about what their culture means as it relates to, to um, trying to prevent these two things, depersonalization, emotional exhaustion. Um, if you wonder whether or not, you know, what these questions are like, it, it for the most part means, you know, do you have feelings of being more callous towards people at least weekly? If that's yes, then you're going to probably score positive for depersonalization. Um, or do you feel burned out from work at least weekly? Um, then you're going to, you're going to screen positive for emotional exhaustion. So, so those are the two biggest domains. So what's kind of causing these trends? So um, Mark, yeah, go Mark, ahead. Let me, ask you, let me ask you a question. So, Please. You know, you and I are both old timers. I'm even a little older than you are. And, but we were around medical schools where we interview students by the thousands. Yeah. Are we asking kids who are looking toward careers in medicine, whether it's physician, PA, and so forth, a kid is a compliment, of course, to try to show a level of maturity that is not reasonable at a young age to look way off in the future to determine if they'll get burned out about something? How can they look so far off in the future? Yeah, that's a great question. I, I, I think that what, um, I, I think, I think it, a couple of things. One is it's probably impossible to really honestly screen for this in an interview. It is probably impossible to predict this with certainty. Um, I do think that um, medical schools have an onus to train students or PA schools or nurse practitioner schools or, or, or maybe even undergraduate schools have an onus to begin to think about how we approach our mental skills that we bring to bear on a task and the actual task itself. We'll talk about this a little bit when I wanna get into some mindfulness discussions, but we have done a phenomenal job training people to check boxes in society in US, training people how to achieve higher levels in the US, training people to be on travel soccer, to be on travel uh, swimming like both of my children were and to push, 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 but to what end, you know? And um, I think that it is not something that I can answer from the standpoint of just an interview for residency. I think there's some societal issues that are, are really kind of at play here. Um, I think that who you're around, your sense of community matters. And, you know, I'll ask people a little bit about their friends, about their mentors and, and or about where the, what experiences they've learned from or have they faced adversity? And, and I don't really wanna know that they were tough or strong. I wanna know, you know, what tools did they bring to the table, you know? Um, and, and so that's, you know, that's kind of the, I guess that's kind of a quick answer to that, Ray. And I, I think we'll get into it a little bit more. That's great. I, um, I just look back at myself when I was applying 47 years ago and my own level of immaturity at that time, I, I left pre-law to go into pre-med and golly, if you'd asked me to look ahead at all of these issues, I don't know how much I would have known about that or could have predicted about depersonalization, about burnout and so forth. I don't want to slow you down, but I, I just... That, that, that was something I wanted to bring up during the yeah, talk. This I mean, my personal belief too is that the biggest difference between then and now is social media, which can be an amazingly powerful tool in bringing us together and getting this degree of platform for 716 people to be on this, on this discussion. But it can be an incredibly erosive thing in terms of understanding an individual's place in the big picture. Um, and, and I, you know, I, I felt this a little bit in the early days of COVID too, when all you do is look and see that, you know, oh, there's a nurse who died of COVID here and there's a doctor who's getting intubated there. And, you know, you see these things and they are incredibly negative for well-being. And it is difficult to put that into context of the real, the real world, um, you know, and what matters. And what matters is right here, right now in this community that we happen to find ourselves in. Um, whether you're in school and we're talking about your friends and your colleagues and your buddies, whether we're talking about an EMS crew, whether we're talking about, you know, your colleagues who are, who are learners in, in class with you. So um, we'll dig into that a little bit more. Um, so this, uh, these are sort of the drivers of, um, of uh, 
basically either wellness or burnout. And they're, and they're kind of written in a way that if there's problems on these drivers, then there can be burnout. And if there's great solutions here, then it can be for well-being. Because this is a little bit of a seesaw, right? A balancing act between, between well-being and burnout. Um, they're not opposite sides of the coin. They're just multiple factors that are all the time at play to a different degree. And in an ideal world, you've maxed out on all of these, all of these uh, um, domains here. And we'll talk a little bit about some of them. And then it's also really important to, to think that these domains act at different levels. There's the individual you, there's your work unit, maybe the emergency department, there's your organization, which is the gigantic huge thing that you work for. And then there's national trends, the opioid crisis, um, you know, um, COVID, things like that, right? So again, there's, there's individual factors, work unit factors, organization factors, and then all of those other kind of you know, drivers and things like that. Um, yeah, and so we've already kind of talked a little bit about those. I'm gonna cone in on a few of these things because I wanna talk about how we can change um, the narrative, how we can, again, sort of prevent burnout, maximize well-being. And I really wanna talk about this for just a moment. This is new content that I put into this, this uh, lecture just for, for here today. Um, I, I basically do a lot of mindfulness. I do some meditation. Um, I use an app that I'm going to share with you that I think is worth checking out. Um, and the app um, interviews people and also has, you know, timers for meditation, guided meditation, 10 minutes you can sit and listen to some meditation techniques. And one of the people who's interviewed was Lori Santos. She's a PhD at Yale. She specializes in understanding what's unique about the human brain. And she teaches a class called um, Science of Happiness. And when she was interviewed, the, one of the questions came up, what can you do as an individual to try to be happy? And she, she mentioned four things. You might want to write these down. They're kind of important. One, social connection with others. Two, be other oriented. Try to help others or charity. Three, general health habits. These are things like get enough sleep, do a little bit of exercise. Yes, yoga, if you like to do yoga. Um, you know, the, the kind of general health habits. And then number four, mindfulness, meditation. All of these things, there is science behind, contributes to having more happiness in standardized scores of happiness. Because you can measure anything, you can measure happiness. And that's what she and her team does and others have done. Um, and what she said is that it's really interesting that intuitively we think that a lot of these things don't work. One of the things she talked about was talking to strangers. When you're in line trying to get your Starbucks, talk to the barista. Find out how their day is going. Find out where they're from. Say hi. People who do that have been scientifically shown to have higher happiness scores. Not only that, people who don't do that have been scientifically proven to actually improve their responses on happiness scores. Now me, I don't like that. I don't do that. I don't, I don't necessarily like to talk to strangers. It doesn't come naturally to me. My wife, it does. My brother, it does. But I've started doing this more and more and more. And especially now with COVID and everyone being non-connected, it, it really does matter a little bit. I feel a little bit better about some things. Um, why don't I do it? Mainly because I'm on my damn phone. I mean, that's what I'm doing in line for Starbucks because I'm trying to check all of my emails from Rachel. <laughs> no, no, just kidding. Rachel was phenomenal. Um, she emailed me every single thing that I needed to do for this and um, trusted me that I would get it done on time. But um, it's terrible. And my kids, this is, this is you know, it is eroding a ton of stuff. Um, you know, and, and so, so there's, it's a really good thing to kind of listen to. Um, I try to put my phone down at work and shift and, and certainly when I'm around other human beings, because it is really not, it, it's almost as though somebody has just launched a, an experiment on 6 billion people on the planet on how we connect with one another and drop these phones on us. But anyway, um, so a lot of what we might think would be difficult and anxiety proven and not work, it actually does, is associated with improving happiness. Same thing with charity. You might think, man, I'm tired, I'm tired, I'm tired. I need to basically spend some money and go get a massage or get a manicure. Turns out in scientific psychology studies, when you say, no, I'm gonna give you a gift card, either get a manicure for yourself or give a manicure to somebody else and you give it to somebody else, you actually score higher on happiness scales. So these are some specific resources. Um, check her out, Lori Santos, The Science of Happiness. You can take this class. I think you can either audit it or just take it for free as long as you're not gonna claim course credit on Coursera. It is one of the highest um, enrolled classes at Yale and one of the highest classes on Coursera, which is an online free learning. Well, it's not free, but I think if you audit it, it's free. And then the app I, I really like is Waking Up. 
Um, it's uh, non-religious, non-spiritual, you know, non basically app for mindfulness and meditation and a whole lot of other things. The tagline is, you know, how do you, you know, live a meaningful uh, life? Uh, Headspace, you'll hear a lot about. Um, I haven't, haven't used it. And then think about resources at your institution. If you are feeling down, sad, you know, really finding anxiety or depression is interfering in your ability to function, to find meaning, to connect with others, um, ensure that you're reaching out to some people, counselors, therapists, psychiatrists, friends, family, mentors um, to ensure that you're you're getting you're getting some help and, and don't be afraid to talk about this stuff because um, you know th these are these are extraordinarily common and I've shared with you that a large number of, of doctors will feel some symptoms of burnout and other things. We're going to talk about collegiality. I've already told you guys how I love social media and iPhones and and you know you'll see my Twitter handles down there. I'm, you can follow me on Twitter. Um, I may follow you back. I don't know. I'm just not on it a ton and when I am I mainly just post haikus. So you can check it out. Got a haiku from a week or two ago. Check it out. But um, yeah, that's uh, me at dmark123w10. But otherwise, man, I almost hate my phone and I hate uh, when other people are on the phone. I also just hate the telephone in the hospital because I think it contributes to depersonalization. I was asked in a meeting like by my chair um, and they brought in some big time leaders of the institution. Like, what can we do to improve well-being and improve everybody getting along and like nobody raised their hand and I raised my hand and I'm like, um, you know what I think would really help is if we got a kick-ass coffee machine in the doctor's lounge. And everyone kind of laughed, but I was actually serious. I was like, if you, if you put a really nice coffee machine in there, people will go and hang out, they'll talk to each other, they'll form some relationships. I'm like, that actually will help build community. I wrote this up when I was the, um, the uh, president of SAM, which is our academic organization in emergency medicine. So you can, you can scope that out and read that whole thing if you want. But it's basically me just kind of spewing some of these same ideas as, as I'm sharing with you right now. Um, but you can look it up online. Um, and, and I said, until we can interact with each other as human beings and see others in the modern medical machine as unique individuals, we'll struggle with treating patients as human beings and unique individuals. So, you know, really trying to break these barriers starts with the way we treat each other. And I know Dr. Morchetti and Dr. Salivar could, and, and Dr. Fowler could give you tons of examples of times we've called people on the phone and just had really negative interactions, you know, and, and it's, it stinks because like nine out of 10 times when you get two attendings or two doctors together face to face to talk, like things get solved. Um, but the phone is, is in many ways an enemy. We're going to talk yeah, about well, another, you know, uh, yeah, go Matt ahead. Morchetti was, Morchetti was bemoaning the fact that we can't have wine dispensers at work. Oh yeah. Yeah. That, that <laughs> I, I wasn't in service on that for this call, Brandon. So I'm going to have to take you, take, uh, take that back to you guys. Why do you, know, why do you think uh, Fowler's in Georgia right now? Yeah, yeah, good point. I know, I know, yeah. I know. <laughs> okay. So um, Mark, you know, I, I think as, as an old man in medicine, who's on the downslope of his career, I, the social aspects of the work, I think give me a strong shield from burning out, from loss of compassion. I get so much energy from the people I'm around. If you will just stroke those relationships, you know, uh, it's the nurses, it's the techs, it's everybody. Everybody has a place. There is no letter I in team, uh, as corny as that is, but it's true. And I, I think that, you know, we have both a professional but a social relationship to work as well. Yeah, and I really like the fact that you said nurses and techs and in EMS. It's it's hard to remember everyone's name, but it doesn't take that much to just talk to them. Um, and and a lot of times, just involving them in some of the 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 decision making and uh, uh, the discussion about care, or asking them how their day is, or understanding who their family might be, it goes a long way. Um, you know, my wife is a physician assistant. She trained with a guy named Chuck Edwards, and he was a CT surgeon in Charlotte, North Carolina, and she was. He, you know, he was her boss and, you know, it, there was story after story after story of him going out of his way to know about everybody from the janitor who cleans up the OR to, you know, the, the top of the health system and, and treat them all the same and treat them with respect and his time and his attention. Um, and, and so I, I you, you, you model that, Dr. Fowler. I mean, it is, it is not something that you just say. It is the way you operate, the way you act. And, and anybody in, in Parkland Emergency Department and the EMS scene here in Dallas would say the same thing. So, you know, you guys that are a little bit younger have to figure out how you integrate that into your life. And it starts by, you know, 
spending time doing it, deliberately doing it, not being on your phone. I mean, I'm not saying you got to be a Luddite like Dr. Fowler and not have a, a, a cell phone and actually just have a flip phone, you know, but <laughs> yeah, exactly. But, but there is some way that you can, you can find the happy medium. Um, we'll talk a little bit about the EMR, the EHR, the electronic <laughs> health record, the medical record. I thought that it was the source of all kinds of burnout. I did not like having to learn all kinds of stuff. I found it inefficient. I think, you know, we don't have a lot of good efficient EMR systems. It's not really subject to much of a market. There's really only one or two or three players in the entire market who create medical records. Um, so I, I came to, to this topic thinking that the, that the EHR was a horrible source of burnout. We're gonna talk about it. Um, this is another great article. If you want to read one awesome article um, from this talk, Atul Gawande in The New Yorker, 2018, November 12th, um, has an entire discussion. The title of it is called The Upgrade. I think you can get it free online, but it's essentially a whole deep dive on the EMR and where we were and where we're going. Um, and, and noting really that, you know, it is a, humong a humongous endeavor financially. Um, one of the quotes was three years later, I've come to feel that a system that promised to increase my mastery over my work has instead increased my work's mastery over me. And it's true, like you'll sometimes go to work and you will feel like, dang, like I gotta spend all this time on the computer and I really wanna be going and sitting down and looking Mrs. So-and-so in the face and talk to her about X, Y, and Z that she's scared of. Um, but it, it, it really is something that, that I think is important to think of. And this is the case no matter what you're going into. Again, PA, nurse, nurse practitioner, doctor, doesn't matter. You're sitting in front of a computer more often than you'd like to admit and think. Um, and that's the interesting thing, because if you guys really were shadowing, like in-person shadowing, you would see us on our computer. <laughs> Like that's, <laughs> that's what the, the emergency department experience would be for some period of time. Um, it wouldn't be us saving lives. I mean, maybe there would be a little bit of life saving, but it would be a lot of us on our computer. Um, it is crazy to think about, right? So I kind of thought that this was a really bad thing. And, and there's a great quote, which is, we don't have an electronic medical record. We have a billing platform disguised as an EMR. Um, because even when you do spend the time in the medical record to really try to get information that's critical to take care of a patient, it takes forever. Um, it really was not designed as something that's designed for research or designed for efficiency or designed for patient communication or designed for physician efficient extraction of information. It has been and was and is designed and functions primarily as a way to document some stuff to basically get a bill. So what about scribes? A lot of you guys may be scribes. Maybe you've been, have been scribes in the past. Maybe you've heard about scribes. Um, scribes might be uh, on your exam for this content. We'll see. Um, medical scribes are trained assistants who work alongside physicians to take computer related tasks off their hands. This fix is admittedly a little ridiculous. We replaced paper with computers because paper was inefficient. Now computers have become inefficient. We're hiring more humans and it sort of works. Again, this is from that Atul Gawande article. So it's kind of funny to think about like, um, you know, what's, what's going on with, with scribes and, um, you know, how we have gotten to the point where we have to hire people to basically just kind of go in the room with us and listen to us talk to human beings and, you know, spend their time and effort keying into a computer. Um, it's probably not going away, although there are a little bit of some, you know, improvements in um, you know, voice transcription that might make scribes a little bit less critical, but, um, but scribes really do a lot of work in entering orders and um, doing a whole lot of other stuff too. Uh, Mark, I said, I've said for years to the students and the residents that one of the best investments, one of the top 10 investments I made in my career was Mrs. Glidden's typing course in high school. Oh, and then I, I also played the piano, so my hands were really fast and nimble. And so I could fly at the keyboard. And so the EMR for me was not in my way because I could type fast. Yeah. And, and I, I only bring that up just because I, I was really blessed to learn typing early. And so I would encourage everyone listening to think about that because you're going to be at the keyboard a lot. Yeah. And it's, it's also, it's interesting too, in that if you watch some of the residents that are really, really, really efficient, they will have adapted some things, you know, there's these things called dot phrases, which are ways that you can auto program if you type in dot blah, blah, blah. 
you know, the computer will dump in, you know, some standardized kind of templated um, words. Um, and so some of our residents that are super, super efficient have kind of figured that out and are better at it than me for sure. Um, it's almost a skill in and of itself. And it's almost something that's just evolved by natural selection, um, you know, as a countermeasure that people have adapted to try to, try to uh, you know, spend, you know, less time in the computer and more time with the patients. Now, it's an interesting thing because is it really more times with the patient that you want or is it just more patients that you want because you're being reimbursed per patient seen? Or is it a little bit of both? And that's, a, that's another kind of weird thing to get into. Um, one of the things I was interested at during the last year I was at Northwestern was, you know, how much time was spent in the EMR. And I did this project because I thought that I spent way too much time in the EMR, that I myself was very inefficient and that I hated it and that it was a big source of my well, un, unhappiness was the time I spent in the EMR. And so I actually did a project where I measured the amount of time that physicians that I worked with thought that they were in the EMR and then the actual amount of time that they were in the EMR. And so let's take a look at that and just see what it showed. So this was some of the data where I basically said, well, how, how much time do you think per shift are you logged into Epic, which is one of the companies that makes an EMR. And, and it doesn't matter which company it is. Epic is the biggest, most important, largest market share. But, um, you know, how many minutes do you think you are? Now, our shifts were eight-hour shifts, right? And so, you know, this is the middle kind of number here. You know, a lot of people thought 180 minutes. Okay, 180 minutes, that's three hours. Three hours. You, you think that you're in the EMR for three hours? And then a fair number of people thought that it was 200 or more. I mean, even 300. I mean, this starts to get to be nonsense, right? I mean, 300 is, is like five hours. I mean, just, but maybe though, may, maybe you're staying an hour or two after shifts. Maybe you're going home and you're charting. I don't know. But, you know, the interpretation was that emergency doctors perceive that they are spending a ton of time in the EMR. And I bet the same would be the case at, at Parkland if we were to do this with the residents and attendings. I, I bet, and I haven't, I, this was all just attendings. I didn't, I didn't query the residents, but I bet if we were to say, how many times do you think you are keyed in, logged in, to Epic, um, what it would be. And I, I bet it would be a pretty high number. Now this counts doing the note, this counts ordering, this counts looking up lab results, counts looking up you know, radiology results, but that's the perception. Now what's the reality? Um, this is some data right after we actually got the EMR. Um, when we're still learning, we're struggling. Um, and it turns out that it was 133 minutes, okay? which is a lot of time. I mean, that's two hours of an eight hour shift. You are sitting down on a keyboard. Okay. Um, and then here, over here, um, you know, after several months goes by and we become a little bit more efficient and we, you know, develop some shortcuts and some dot phrases, you know, the number goes down to about 97 or, you know, a little, a little over, um, you know, an hour and a half. Um, so an hour and a half out of an eight hour shift. Okay. Maybe that's not so bad, but the point is it is way, 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 way lower than what we perceive, including myself. So, you know, I was of the opinion that this was the worst thing in the world, that the EMR was just the enemy, it was horrible, that this was just eroding my well being. And, you know, God, if we could just solve this, I'd be able to sit at the bedside and talk to patients about stuff that really matters. Well, not really, not really. So, um, and then this shows a little bit what the distribution is. This, this is the total number of minutes per shift. And this is just a distribution frequency. So these are numbers of attendings that would spend this much time. Um, and, and most of them were, were kind of in the middle or even on the shorter end. But then you look at this and this is what's called a tail in statistics or you know, a whole bunch of people that are spread out here in the extreme. And the same thing was the case for fall data. Even after we had gotten better, there was one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine people that were 20, uh, 25th percentile or lower in terms of their speed of charting or in terms of the amount of time that they were spent in the EMR. Um, and so there's variance. Um, not everybody is fast. Not everybody is slow. This isn't smooth. Some people are spending a hell of a lot of time in the EMR. Now, maybe they like it. Maybe they're doing it for med mal reasons. Maybe they're doing it just because they're slow typers and didn't take Dr. Fowler's typing class. Um, don't know. But, um, you know, the next stage would be to approach these people and say, well, is there some things that we could do to help you with your efficiency? 
um, and think about, about that. But even still, I'm not sure that that is going to necessarily make these people have well-being because I'm not you know, really Mark, sure. That, mm-hmm. Yeah, I, uh, I leave the EMR open in front of me pretty much all the time. Uh, as I think most people probably do, I may not be typing on it all the time, but I also, uh, I have one thing that I've gotten into from a safety perspective, which is the fact that at the end of the patient stay, I go through the chart on the EMR one more time. And I look at everything one more time, just as a, yeah. just as a, pure, as a pure safety measure, you know? Yeah. 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 And that's a good point because what Dr. Fowler is mentioning is that The EMR is a really complicated thing for a given patient encounter. It's not just Dr. Fowler in his note. It's the nursing notes. It's the radiology note. It's the lab results. I mean, it's a really complex living thing for that encounter. Our part as the doctor is just one bit of that. And so he's he's kind of mentioning that, which is an important thing. Um, The one thing I would say about your first point, which is, you know, I leave the EMR open, This came from EPIC data. You can get what's called PEP data or provider efficiency profile data, which actually measures how many minutes you are actively keying into stuff. So it actually does not count the time that you walk away from your computer and leave it open or um, that you log off or whatever. It's it's active time, keying in things, interacting live with the EMR. I have no idea how EPIC would do it. It's a little bit weird and creepy that they do have that data on every single person in the US, you know, but... um, that is, that is available as what's called PEP data. Um, you know, and, and, and I, I guess I might have found a lot more desire to dig into this if I thought this was the solution to burnout or this was going to enhance and b- deliver a ton of well being to my faculty. But what I kind of think, and we'll get into a little bit later, is that this is just one piece. There's the personal aspects to well being and burnout, there's the health system factors. And a lot of it has to do with stuff beyond the EMR. How many patients are boarding and waiting to go upstairs? How challenging is it for you to get the resources that you need for your patients? To what degree do you have willing consultants and partners on the other side? To what degree do you have willing patients to motivate them for their own well-being? So a lot of other factors that could go into, you know, well-being, yes, no, than the EMR. Um, And I think we got a QA session coming up too. So, just real quick summary on this stuff. Maslock burnout inventory is the main way burnout's been measured to date. It identifies two domains, emotional exhaustion, depersonalization. About 50% of physicians from early research about eight years ago were reporting burnout. That number is up and down a little bit since then. Um, emergency medicine still is uh, one of the specialties that, that has been highlighted as being at risk for burnout. But there's a difference between work-life balance and, and burnout. Um, And then we talked a little bit about drivers on the site of action being either individual, work unit, organizational, and national. You can't change the national stuff. You can't change your entire organization. You might be able to change your work unit by becoming a leader or articulating for what your patients need or thinking about efficiency to your emergency department or your clinic or your, you know, whatever it may be. And then, you know, the individual, yeah, that's you. You own that. So that is mindfulness. That is who you spend your time with. That is, do you have a sense of community? That is, you know, what are you doing for the general health habits? Um, and, and, you know, a lot of that kind of stuff. So the individual stuff is a little bit easier, modifiable for you. Um, all right. So covered a lot of stuff. That is the main scientific deep dive on burnout that I wanted to get through. Um, Now, later, I've got some kind of slides where I talk about my own personal approach to emergency medicine and shifts and how I still come to work happy. Um, So the next part is a little bit more personal um, and is not as critical, important. It certainly isn't grounded in science at all. Um, We'll have plenty of time for the next session. So we have plenty of time right now for as much Q&A as Dr. Fowler and Rachel and and others um, would like to entertain. We have a way we have a bunch of questions. questions. (laughs) (laughs) Um, One of the questions we got uh, was highly requested is what are some best long term action items and suggestions you have for addressing the stigma and the dismissiveness that exists in medical education, especially towards like burnout? Oh, boy. Um, Yeah, I think so. You're getting at the question of 
you know, gee, you may be a student in medical education or a pre-med student, and you may be, you may feel as though this is an important topic, and it just is not resonating among leadership. Uh, it's not something that, you know, the, the dean of a medical school cares about, or it's not something that you necessarily feel is, um, is appropriate to bring up, or maybe it seems to be stigmatized. So a couple of things. One is um, be careful in making too many assumptions, because it may be something that is important to some of the leaders of, you know, medical education. It's just you're not in the room to hear it, or these people have not articulated it, or it hasn't shown up on, you know, a strategic plan for them, or it may be that they're just unaware of to what degree this is something that needs to be addressed. Um, I would be surprised if they don't know that this is a challenge and a problem. Um, now, they, but, but I hear what you're saying. It's kind of like, well, you know, I mean, the old line guard just feels as though if you're complaining about seeing too many patients that you're just a complainer and, you know, it's, that's, that's not the solution to burnout. Um, I, I think that framing this in the context of we collectively as a group of students or me as an individual leader or me as a person who is paying 40, 50, $80,000 per year for this education, find this topic to be critical for my well-being and my ability to care for human beings forever, including when you're old and I need to take care of you, is really important. And just beginning to have a dialogue. Um, I think if you can find some common interest, if you can find some common pathways to get some of these topics on the agenda and on the horizon for collective team healthcare provider, uh, health, health education leaders, um, it's good. In other words, I guess what I'm saying is staging a sit-in may not be the best way to go about it, but finding out how to work through your medical school student council or your resident governance committee or getting some allies in some of your mentors to help form some student slash educate educator teams to bring some requests to leadership is probably the way to go. Um, and, and I think it's a function of let's explore things that might work. Let's look at medical schools or medical education centers that are doing the best job of this. What is Stanford doing? Does it work? Does it not work? What could we steal from them? What should we steal from them? Um, you know, what, what might make the biggest difference here? Um, having some dialogue about that and being open to an iterative dialogue and process probably is the way to go, um, as opposed to, you know, we need more time off, more time off, more time off, more time off, because it's really not about that. It's about, we need meaning, we need, we need formal training and maybe in mindfulness, we need um, community. And I mean, real community, not just like, oh, here you go, here's a listserv, boom, these are your peers. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. um, and, and I think that's tough right now and folks are still kind of socially distanced as a result of COVID, but I think it's gonna go away, COVID is, um, at least the, the badness of it is. And, um, the, the social disconnection is. And so th this is, there is going to be some grounds to, to kind of readdress this. And it may be even more important then than now, depending on to what degree schools need to understand and, and, and listen to learners and, and even applicants. I think it's a great question. I wish I had some more solutions on that. Uh, that was a great answer and you know starting that conversation I think is really important. Um, I think some of the students are also wondering about starting that conversation even as an applicant you know talking about mental health so how would you navigate um, <laughs> talking yeah. about mental health for like oh, yeah. on an application? Yeah no that's a so, so I think on an application your job is to try to show in an honest humil way with humility that you have had some adversity and you have learned from that and you have, um, you, you have, um, you've become stronger in terms of your interest in pursuing career X, Y, or Z. I don't think that in the application is the way to have a gigantic dialogue about your own personal well-being and the requirements that you have in going to an institution. Um, you should have done your homework and know that that institution at least is a place that you feel kind of comfortable about. Um, a lot of where you choose to do your training is based on gut level instinct, um, as opposed to numbers and data and stuff like that. Um, that's harder to do when you have to do virtual interviews and virtual, you know, web reviews of institutions, but there is a feel that you can kind of get from some places. 
But I think you can also just ask some questions about, well, I'm really interested in finding a meaningful career by going into academics. Tell me what the track record is of your residency and having people go into academics and what kind of jobs do they have? Hmm, okay, you know, that's, a, that's the beginning to the question or, um, or a question might be, I am very interested in forming community among my students. I realize everyone's coming from different places. Tell me about the programs that exist at you know, school X that are specifically done to help students find community and how meaningful is that and how does that grow? And maybe some of the best people to ask that questions to are the students or the residents or the people who are gonna be your peers. Now they're not exactly gonna answer the question 100%, but you'll probably be able to get a little bit more of a straight answer than not. And if it looks like what they're saying to you is all just fluff, then you probably have to know that. And then you might say, well, you know, institution X is a little bit less um, supportive in terms of these things than maybe institution Y. Um, and then I think another thing is just, are there students there that look like you, seem like you, kind of feel like there's a little bit of a fit. Um, you know, that can be tough. I left Arizona and went to Texas and thought everyone was gonna be wearing cowboy boots and hats. And, um, you know, some did, but most didn't. And most people were from all over the place. And some of my students that, you know, I was hanging out with that grew up in Austin were way more like me than I could have possibly imagined. So, you know, assumptions can sometimes be wrong. I think that's another good question. Um, and it's a little bit tough to think through, but I guess what I would say is, the answer should not be just time off or mandatory X, Y, and Z, or, oh, we've got a wellness you know, class that you have to take that you got to sit in another lecture hall and listen to some more crap. It should be community-based, collective. It should be, it should be a little bit about personal journeys in finding the quietness of being comfortable with yourself. And when, you know, and not task saturated, not just this is spoon filling you what the solution is that we're going to template for 150 students, because your solution to wellness is in some ways going to be a little personal. Mm -hmm. um, so going on about, you know, having that conversation of wellness, do you, is it common for physicians to have conversations between themselves or like other healthcare professionals about their wellness, about their burnout? Is there really a support system that you see in the hospital for that? You know, so, I mean, we have formal support system, um, you know, in, in terms of faculty and, and to some degree also with residents too, um, in that you can find anonymous counseling if you feel like you're really at a, at a point of being um, at the end of your rope from a suicidality standpoint or even an anxiety depression standpoint or an effectiveness standpoint or a loneliness standpoint. Yes, there, we, we have formal um, confidential programs for that. And every single thing that we have has been amped up a little bit as a result of COVID, meaning more emails, more opportunities, more people employed to do that. Um, I would say that the other thing that our institution utilizes and our department utilizes is coaching. If I were to guess what's going to be some of the biggest improvements in addressing this for the entire U.S. healthcare system, it's going to be the concept of professional coaching. Um, a coach is not a therapist. A coach is not a psychiatrist. A coach is somebody who can externally look at you and see patterns of successful work or maladaptive work and say, you know what? I've noticed that this is how you're spending your time. I've noticed that this is how you're dealing with your email. I've noticed this is how you're communicating in difficult situations. I've noticed that these are some of the things that you've struggled with. Let me listen to you and hear you and let us work together on how to solve that. I had heard about coaching professionally and I was like, whatever, dude, this is ridiculous. I was like, I've, I myself personally, I swam in high school. I did a bunch of competitive triathlon when I, over the last 15 years, um, I think of coaches as being people that tell you to do stuff, coaches that give you basically a workout, but a professional coach is not that a professional coach is a really good listener. A professional coach helps you unlock some of the secrets to efficiency or well-being or operating at the top of your game. So we have professional coaches at UT Southwestern um, and you know, they're available specifically to help this. There are professional coaches that, you know, make billions of dollars and do this for, you know, banking executives um, and people all across uh, the United States in professional areas. So 
Um, I do think that we're going to see a little bit more coaching going on. Um, we did a group coaching you know, session as part of um, our department where we had people who wanted to opt in and volunteer for a group coaching session where 12, 15 people got together on Zoom and talked about some of the common collective challenges that they're dealing with. Um, that was about three months, four months into COVID. And so a lot of what they shared were challenges with childcare, challenges with concern about PPE availability, challenges with, you know, trying to balance kids at home, you know, on Zoom school. And I think it was helpful for them to all share these things and realize that, that a lot of them are similarly felt. And some of them had developed some solutions that they were willing to share in that kind of group coaching session. So I think, I think coaching is going to be an increasing used um, uh, tool to help fight burnout and help promote well-being. Wow, I didn't know that there are professional coaches. That sounds really cool. Yeah, and there's um, another article by Atul Gawande, um, if you want to dig into in The New Yorker, about coaching. I can't remember what the title of it is, um, but you should check it out. It's um, I can give you the PDF or a link to it um, when we're done if you want to. It's, it's uh, one of the best uh, medical layperson um, things that you will read. Um, and it's his own personal experience dealing with a coach, getting a coach and what he thinks it can and can't do. So super useful to check out. I am absolutely down to have that. And I will send it out to all the students. We have actually an interesting finds document in our shared Google drive of all the cool articles and, um, stories from yeah. all of the sessions that students can check out. So yeah, I and I'll get to these to other ones that came up in the last, uh, you know, 30 minutes. We were talking about the Maslock burnout inventory paper and then that one of those Stanford papers. So I'll, I'll give those to you as well. Perfect. Thank you so much. Uh, another question that we had was, so say that, like, you see that your fellow coworker is experiencing burnout. Like, how would you talk to them about it? Boy, yeah, so... I think that a couple of things. One is, I think this should be done ideally not in front of everybody. I think this should be ideally done not in the workplace. Um, I know that's hard when we're kind of socially distant, di distancing and not really doing a whole lot with each other socially. But, you know, you can go somewhere and sit outside at a cafe with somebody and wear a mask or at least be six feet away and be able to have a conversation. You know, I mean, there's ways to do that. Um, and, and I think that the, um, the, the way to do that, that I would probably think about doing is just listening again. And, you know, starting with some, you know, how are things going? Um, you know, what's some of the stuff that's, that's presenting you the most challenges? Or, you know, gee, I remember, you know, you were interested in, uh, I don't know, I'm just going to say, research on hangnails. I'm just making something up. And that was your passion. But I noticed you really haven't been doing a whole lot of work and research on whatever it is. And, you know, just how are things going with your time? Um, and listen, stop talking and listen. I think that's really, really, really important. Um, I, think, I think if you just be quiet and you listen and you care about the person that you're listening to, things will emerge and things will come up that will be really, really useful. And that will be seen as um, true interest in that other person's well-being. Um, so that's, I think, the way I would answer that. And I've had some of those same conversations. I've had those conversations with my wife. I've had those conversations with my brother. I've had those conversations internally with myself when I'm trying to think a little bit about, you know, how I'm feeling, how I'm doing, um, and just normalizing that it's okay. Um, I I've even said to some patients, you know, hey, it's okay that you've got some chest pain and that it lasted for a few seconds and it went away and you're here in the emergency room. You know, I, I, think, I think some of this may be a little bit contributed by anxiety and that's okay because I'm, I'm not the kind of doctor to say that this is all anxiety, but you know, the good news is it's not a heart attack. And you know, we all suffer from a lot of anxiety. It is one of the most epidemic things going on in the United States right now for a lot of factors. And, and it's okay because you are among many, many, many people and it is okay and it does get better. It is gonna get better. It's gonna have some ups and downs. So I think this concept of normalizing what people are feeling can also be pretty important too. Absolutely. Um, another question that we had was, um, it, is burnout higher in any sort of group of people? Is it higher in say uh, medical professionals fresh out of school or is it for you know, those professionals that have been practicing for years and years? Yeah, so 
Um, there, there is an interesting, another interesting kind of question is what does burnout look like um, to PAs and what does burnout look like to nurses? And my gut level feeling, having not done a deep, deep, deep dive on this, and I have to be cautious and give you that kind of, you know, um, asterisk, is that nurses are also subject to burnout, but it is more over um, pure just work conditions and what they're feeling and seeing in the work unit as opposed to a feeling of work-life balance because they are a little bit more able to just turn it off, their shift is over, they go home. But their shifts are often 12 hours. And if those 12 hours are an absolute grind because of health system things, then it can be difficult. The physicians is a little bit more on the, I am just emotionally exhausted dealing with X, Y, and Z. Um, and it's, it's, a little bit, it's a little bit less of a, of a, I don't have control over my situation. Um, and PAs are a little bit in the middle. Um, it seems as though there's a little bit of a higher report of burnout among physicians, a little bit lower overall rate of, of burnout among nurses, um, and, and PAs are a little bit in between. But one of the big differences is nurses can change. They can, they can stop doing what they're doing and go do something else in terms of like, I don't want to do emergency medicine. I'm going to go do oncology and find that incredibly rewarding for reasons that are much different than what you'd experience in emergency medicine. And PAs can do that as well. My wife started off doing CT surgery. It was great. Um, and then as we, we had kids and they got a little bit older, you know, she was sort of done being on call and working weekends and running up and down the stairs to go to the ICU to like, you know, run codes and stuff like that and said, you know, I'm going to do interventional radiology. Now, on the other hand, my wife just now tonight, you know, spent two hours putting in two different central lines in a COVID positive patient with all kinds of medical problems and was wearing a papper, you know, for two entire hours continuously. So I have a tremendous amount of respect for what PAs, nurse practitioners do. I know Kyle Martin very well, who talked with you guys a week ago. Um, it's just different. It's a different, it's a different part of the medical pie, a different a component of things. Um, and, and I think to some degree, we are all in the same boat in that we want to feel empowered to have the tools that we need to care for these human beings. And when we have those tools, we're more likely to use them and feel good going home. When we don't, we're more likely to feel challenges. One I've learned with COVID is that the two biggest things in this epidemic that really have sucked is not feeling in control and not having certainty. And yet everybody wants to have certainty. Everyone wants to know who's COVID positive. Everyone wants to know what to do with these people. And everybody wants to feel like they have control. And we, have, we don't. And that, that's been the biggest component of people feeling angst, in my opinion, is don't feel control and don't have certainty. And, and one of the nice things about mindfulness that I have found is when I do it myself personally, I give up this sense of control. I'm just in the moment. I'm just here in the present. I'm just here on this talk. I'm doing the best I can. This is the most important thing to me. I don't care about my feed. I don't care about anything else. That's it. And if you bring that to each patient um, and encounter, I think that is the best way to connect with human beings. And it's the best way to try to realize that there's some stuff you can't control and there's some uncertainty. Wow. Well, um... Thank you for that. And I think you've answered a lot of these questions beautifully. I think students are ready for the next portion. Awesome. Yeah, well, cool. We're going to kind of get into some of this stuff for the next session here. So, you know, this is, again, some of my personal strategies for well-being. And, and some of this is going to involve some cases. So we're going to talk about some emergency medicine stuff that might be fun and interesting. Just kind of, you know, bring it back to a little bit of some medical knowledge for you guys. But I have four principles to optimal ED patient care. So for me, these are the things I teach the people that are medical students or residents that work with me. I think if you have these four things, you are more likely to feel good with your job, your work, your ability to deliver care. And these are unique a little bit to emergency medicine. I'm not sure that these would be the same for a neurosurgeon who does have an awful lot of control and less uncertainty or for, for others. But for emergency medicine in particular, um, these are the things that are most important. Harness the power of reassurance, embrace uncertainty, frame your decisions around the patient's health state, have a definition of what a, constitutes a good shift. So this is a case, 31 year old female, she comes in with chest pain. It's, it's, it's kind of dull, it's kind of achy, it kind of hurts when she swallows. It kind of came on suddenly out of the blue. It's kind of right in the middle of her chest. She's 31 years old lasted for 10 minutes. Now it's gone. 
She doesn't have any shortness of breath, which is what dyspnea is. She was in a long car ride, which is kind of funny as to what constitutes a long car ride. When I lived in Chicago, a long car ride was like two to four hours because it was like an hour and 10 minutes for me to go from the suburbs to, to my job downtown. Now, a long car ride in Texas is like six hours or Big Bend or something like that. I mean, Texas is big. Um, so car rides here, totally different ballgame. But, you know, so we, we know that patients can sometimes have a blood clot. So this could be a blood clot. Um, and, and people are scared of blood clots. And, and you hear about blood clots um, killing some people. And, you know, you've heard that oral contraceptive pills can be associated with blood clots. So this is for sure something that we might think about. Now, whether or not this person needs a test for that is a whole nother question because it's kind of gone. She's feeling better. She's pretty young and healthy. And it's amazing how young gets redefined as you get old. Um, you know, I, I used to, I, I used, I remember one time I was in attending and I had a really puzzling EKG and, you know, I, I looked around the emergency department to see who else was working because I wanted to show them this EKG. And all of a sudden I realized like, oh crap, like I'm it. I'm, I'm the most senior doctor here, you know? <laughs> Uh, and, and so sometimes that's interesting or you find somebody, you know what I mean? You're like, well, that person can't have a heart attack. They're like, they're, they're, you know, they're, they're 31 years old. Or sometimes the residents will be like, well, I don't know. I got this old guy in room, you know, in room 10 and I'm like, well, how old are they? And they're like 50. And I'm like, dang, 50, like I'm 50. Like that's not old. So it is kind of amusing how all of this becomes relative. So this is what's called the PERC rule. A lot of emergency medicine in a lot of medicine in general is, is utilized. And this is one good thing that's come out of the internet, come out of the phone, come out of apps, is uh, this thing called MD Calc. So you guys can check it out. MD Calc is free, just Google MD Calc. And these are a whole bunch of online medical calculators. So things that you can input information into and it will spit out what the probability is of having a blood clot. Um, and this thing called the PERC rule is like, well, if they're not old, their heart rate's not fast, their oxygen level's not low, they don't have a history of blood clots or recent trauma or surgery, they're not coughing up blood, they're not on any uh, um, uh, estrogen, um, they don't have unilateral leg swelling, then you can say, oh, their chance of having the blood clot is less than, you know, one or two percent. Um, and, and this was actually something that, you know, me and, and my mentor, Jeff Klein, and a bunch of colleagues that have become some of my, my really best friends collegially um, invented, developed, like we did the research to come up with this perk rule thing. And um, turns out it, it ends up being kind of useful and, and, and is one of the kind of main ways that people kind of risk stratify patients in the US who are, who are low risk for having blood clots. And so, um, you know, maybe this patient, um, if she wasn't on a birth control pill, I can't remember the exact, um, thing, you know, uh, would, would actually get no testing. You, you, you know, you would say, you know, according to the PERC rule. Now I think I, I apologize. Cause I think this woman was on birth control pills. I should have changed this in the slide. So let's just pretend that's not the case. Let's just assume she's not on any birth control pills at all. And everything else is the same. You know, she would be negative by this PERC rule. She would be thought to be so, so, so low risk that maybe you should consider not doing any tests for her. The tests that, you know, we do for blood clots are either a D dimer, which is a blood test or a CAT scan. And, and maybe, you know, maybe this person is so low risk that you really probably don't need to do that. And what you do need to do is reassurance. So there's a right and a wrong way to do this. And, you know, if you go into the room and you just start spouting off a bunch of stats and numbers and whatever, these, these people will kind of get sick of it um, or they won't understand it, right? But if you go in the room and you say, look, you know, I know that you were concerned. Hey, the good news is that we, um, you know, we've checked you out in terms of listening to your heart and lungs and following your vital signs and your oxygen level's good. And, you know, for a whole lot of reasons, um, I don't think in any way that this is a blood clot and that you're going to be okay. Um, and you could do the same thing for, I don't think this is a stroke. I don't think this is a heart attack. I don't think this is appendicitis. Um, a lot of times we do this in the emergency department, but how well we do it depends on how hard we try to do it and how we communicate with patients. It is the most powerful thing we can do as an emergency doctor is just reassure patients. But it took me years as an attending to kind of figure this out. And how you do it is really, really important. So number one, harness the power of reassurance. Um, how many people leave the emergency department? So what percentage of time do people come to the emergency room thinking they've got a dangerous life-threatening problem and then get to go home? The answer is 80% on average. So that means most of what you're doing as an emergency doctor or a PA or nurse practitioner or nurse is doing some stuff to make sure people are okay and letting them go home. Now, on the other hand, 
here's a whole nother thing. This is a 58 year old, had a brain tumor that was resected, now has shortness of breath, it's severe. They, they almost passed out. You know, their vital signs look terrible. They're breathing fast, their heart's fast, their blood pressure is low, their oxygen is low. You listen to their lungs, they're totally clear. I mean, there's no mystery as to what this is. Um, <clears throat> It is a pulmonary embolism. And, you know, this is a CT scan. This is the aorta right here coming out of the heart. And it branches over here into, I'm sorry, this is the pulmonary artery coming out of the heart. And it branches into the right pulmonary artery and the left pulmonary artery. And all of this darker gray stuff is a blood clot. And this is a blood clot that's pretty big that's blocking almost the entire right side of uh, the blood vessels to the heart. So this is a big, 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 big blood clot in this person. The main way we treat blood clots is with blood thinner medicine to prevent them from getting bigger, or sometimes medicine that dilutes the blood clot, like blood, um, clot buster type medicine called TPA. We know that this is bad because this patient's right ventricle is all dilated here. This is the right um, side of the heart, which shouldn't be this big. It shouldn't be as big as the left ventricle. Again, this is a CAT scan, and we could do an echocardiogram and tell us the same thing. You know, this is the heart upside down. This is kind of the point of the heart. This is the top of the heart. These are the atria right here, um, and this is the right ventricle, and this is the left ventricle. And you can see this right ventricle is big and huge and dilated, and it's pretty much about as big as the left ventricle, which it shouldn't be, but it is because it's pushing against all this pressure of this blood clot, and this is, this is bad news. So you know this patient has a really, 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 really bad blood clot. You know that their blood pressure is low. This patient could die from a blood clot. So you're between a rock and a hard place here. It's really difficult to know what to do. Um, because if you give them systemic TPA, they may bleed because they had recent brain surgery. And that's the big problem. But if you do nothing, they could get worse as well. Now, there are some newer devices that, that are becoming a little bit more utilized by cardiologists and interventional radiologists. Um, and there are some difficult things to try to think through in terms of the risk profile here. Um, but this is not a situation where there's much evidence or there's much certainty at all in what to do. I had an attending that used to say like, Mark, it doesn't matter what you do as long as you're right. Um, his name is Steve Monson. He's like sitting right here. John Marks, my chairman of emergency medicine, um, Sandy Craig, Jeff Runge. These are some of the leaders of emergency medicine at a retreat somewhere in North Carolina. Um, I don't want you guys to think that that's the way emergency medicine was practiced in North Carolina. Um, they just happen to be at a cabin, but otherwise it looks looks kind of kind of hillbilly. Um, but I love them, love them all. Um, they were absolutely phenomenal. So in this situation, you just have to embrace uncertainty. Realize there is no absolute perfect solution to this patient. Frame your decision around the patient's health state. Listen to what their preferences are, what their risk tolerance might be, and and deal with this as a difficult situation. So. Just really wrapping up here on the, the kind of formal content. This is me as a resident and I look pretty happy. I'm smiling, Tree of Life logo, 1997. First job as an attending. I still have pretty much like brown hair, but I got this gray streak, but I'm smiling, um, 2001. Um, and then I'm pretty gray here, still at Northwestern smiling. Um, and then here, boom, still smiling, but I got this horrible badge with this horrible hair that like just looks like Bob Barker from The Price of Right. And they won't let me um, retake my photo, uh, nor will they let me use my middle name. I go by my middle name, Mark. My dad's name's Daniel. And so I, I like going by DMARC because I, I still, you know, get to tri give some tribute to my dad, who honestly, if it wasn't for him, I, I would not be a doctor. Um, even though he wasn't a medical doctor, he, you know, like I said, got his PhD and, and taught me how to be a teacher uh, along with my mom as well. So this is my tryout of happiness. This is how I basically decide that I'm going to go home pretty happy. Um, and, and this might also be on your exam, but you know, what is, what is really the definition of a good shift for me, as long as either a, I've helped someone can be a patient, um, could be family member. I teach someone something could be patient, family member, nurse, tech, EMT, but sometimes you got to go out of your way to teach someone something. Or three, something really, 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 really funny happens. Like you look at the board of chief complaints and you see this one and you're like, wow, like that's going to be amazing. I'm definitely signing up for that patient because only in the emergency department can something like that happen. And I just got to find out what on earth that is. Um, I write a little bit more about this in this blog, EM Mindset, which is um, a product of Alex Koifman and, and some other people. He's one of our faculty members. You can check out EM Mindset um, if you want to read a little bit more about that. So again, that's it. You know, harness power of, of reassurance, embrace uncertainty, frame your decisions around the patient's health state, have a definition of what constitutes a good shift, 
that's some contact information for me. Um, and then, you know, this is a haiku that I wrote. Um, haiku is just 575. Right next to you is the essence of happiness, reliable friends. Um, this is my daughter, Katie Courtney, a long, long, long time ago. She's like, dad, don't put that picture of me in. But I love it because it's just, it's just happiness. It's just, it's just companionship. Uh, my dog, Molly, um, our big backyard, um, you know, a, a good while ago. So that's, a, that's a, one of the haikus that I wrote. Um, so that's, that's kind of it. I've kind of hit you guys with some just more big picture philosophy stuff at the end, but happy to regroup on any of the other specific wellness burnout stuff or anything else that could be provocative that you guys have. Mark, I, this is a phenomenal talk and I, um, I am a big fan of, um, always teaching students that medicine is not just about kind of the clinical case in front of you and the diagnostic dilemmas. The majority of the work of being a clinician you know, really revolves around the the person-to-person uh, -person interactions with your patients and with your with your colleagues um, and your teammates. So you mentioned a couple of keys for you um, in order to prevent burnout, especially during a shift. Now, I want to learn about how you bounce back because in between some of these good things that you put in front of us, there's going to be the difficult conversation about a patient who may be dissatisfied with something or a consultant that disagrees with your management, um, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. How do you bounce back to a positive um, outcome after these negative things so you can get back to these three keys you mentioned? Yeah, no, it's a super good question, Gil. And I am like you, I, I am not immune to those things. I have had plenty of bad outcomes. I've had plenty of difficult conversations. I had just as recently as a week or two ago, you know, somebody send me some email, um, you know, um, wondering why I didn't transfer this patient because they were out of network. Um, never mind the fact that this was an 85 year old woman who, you know, what I mean, was nearly nonverbal and was from a nursing home and wasn't eating and drinking, was transferred to for, for basically failure to thrive and just just not doing well at all. And, you know, she couldn't consent to go to another another hospital. It was also two in the morning. And, you know, what I mean, like, and I get this email, you know, from some administrative person, you know, kind of critical of this. And um, I just deleted it. <laughs> um, you know, I could have responded. Um, and and if, if they were asking me to respond, I would have. If I had to respond, if there was something good that could, could come out of me responding, I would have. But I just deleted it. And probably a younger me wouldn't have done that. Would have gotten pissed off and mad fired off a bunch of stuff, would have brought it to my chair, demanded for my chair to, you know, do something about it. But no, I'm just, I'm, boom, delete it. Um, now, sometimes you can't do that. I mean, sometimes there's just bad, bad, bad outcomes, right? I mean, sometimes, uh, you know, I've made errors. I, I've, I have not made the right call. Or sometimes I've had just to deliver <laughs> horrible news and been involved in horrible outcomes, you know, that just bother me. Um, and I let those emotions come and I realize that they're not going to be with me forever. And, um, and that's kind of how I process it. And then again, I, I do, I hate to say this, but I think the mindfulness approach helps. I think 10 minutes of meditation a day can help. I think that if you really try to understand some of the science of mindfulness, one of the things that is really sort of discussed is the importance of realizing that in consciousness, things come and things go that all we really are and have in some ways at a given point in time is this present moment. And sure, if you want to allow your thoughts to go back and back and back and back, but that's over, that, that event is done, right? And, or you allow your thoughts to go forward, 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 forward. That, that really hasn't happened yet. All that you really can control with respect to your environment, your thoughts, your mood, how you talk to your significant other, to what degree you bring this to the next shift, all that you really have is the present moment. And sometimes slowing everything down and sitting peacefully for 10 minutes, counting your breaths or doing whatever mindfulness thing you find can, can help with that. It has at least helped with me. Um, and then I, I guess some of it is also just age and time and perspective too. G Gil, you are a master educator. I mean, I appreciate that question a ton. I appreciate your interest in in throwing the question out there but man hats off to you because you are every good of an educator of, of anyone i have seen both in the ed and outside of the ed and the amount of work that you can do to stuff that's not just in the emergency department 
and, and also Dr. Morchetti and the amount of work he does beyond just the emergency department with respect to leading Dallas Fire Rescue, paramedics and working with, uh, with Marshall Isaacs and, and you know, his leader in that is an impressive amount of, of work and good to, to do too. Well, Mark, I mean, you, you humble me beyond belief. And um, I think the one piece of advice that I've had is uh, folks like you who have been around the block uh, maybe with a few more gray hairs have taught me a lot about emotional intelligence and managing myself as a professional. At some point in my career, I may have been known as a bit of a hothead, maybe a little bit of a cowboy. I settled down nicely thanks to uh, having listened to folks like like you and Ray and yeah. maybe Brandon learn a few things from me along the way too. One of the things I teach the residents real simplistically, and I violated these rules, but rules to mitigate conflict in the emergency department. One, um, don't yell, at least try not to yell. Number two, don't swear, or at least try not to swear. But most importantly, most importantly, number three, really try to frame every single thing around what you think is in the best interest for that patient. And that's the most important thing, because if you do that and it's reflected in the chart or, or, or your heart is really, it, it's hard to accuse you of doing wrong in that situation, you know? So Mark, um, I'm, I'm rereading uh, John Hersey's book about Hiroshima, where he talks about the bombing and then he follows uh, the lives of six people for 40 years after the bombing. And it was very interesting, one of whom was a physician who himself became ill and he was sort of about to give up when one of his family members reminded him of the oath that he took uh, as a physician in Japan and that oath was, medicine is the art of compassion. And I, it, I really realized that reading that book now for the third time, it really settled with me. The fact that for all these 700 attendees tonight and the wonderful team that we have uh, here, that what we're really talk about is the path is to be a, the path of medicine is to make an art of being compassionate to the people we serve. Yeah. Yeah. I, I, I mean, I agree a hundred percent. You and I shared a whole lot of similar reading interests. I'm going to definitely dig into that for a lot of reasons. Um, you know, that book. And, and um, I think what I would build on and say what you're hearing in that quote is the aspect of medicine as being a vocation and not a job. And there's a big difference between the two, right? A job is a task. It's something you have to do. Um, a vocation is a calling. A vocation is something you feel compelled to do or led to do, or you, you approach with some humility, or um, it, it is different. And, and I do fear that with the industrialization of medicine to some degree, with the phone, with um, even, you might even say artificial intelligence 20 years from now, I don't know, right? That we are losing the vocation aspect of medicine. And I hate to say it, but emergency medicine is a little bit at fault for this, right? Because, you know, we came onto the, the field as shift workers. And lo and behold, now a lot of other people in medicine are shift workers. You know, hospitalists are shift workers, intensivists are shift workers, anesthesiologists are shift workers, right? And, and I get it, I understand that, but that has diminished our view in the public eye as doctors, as more like people who have jobs. Um, now, I, I think it's another interesting, I think you, the same thing is really important to think about, you know, folks that are PAs and nurse practitioners and all that and, and what where they fit into this. And, you know, um, they work hard. I mean, they work hard for, you know, less money and, and, and some med mal risk and sometimes, you know, less, less guidance and, and all that. So we're all part of the team. Um, and again, it gets back to the question of why. Why do you guys have some interest in this ideally vocation that you're thinking about? And I'd also say that there's nothing that's permanent. Um, you know, my brother did three years of uh, orthopedic surgery residency and quit and had a bit of an existential crisis and decided he was going to go into emergency medicine. Um, and I was like, are you sure you were, you know, totally cool to emergency medicine when you were a, a, an ortho resident? Um, and, and he, you know, matched and started over again, did emergency medicine. Um, you know, my wife started when we first met interested in being a doctor and found uh, the root of being a PA to be a perfect fit for her. My daughter may very well be a PA um, or she may choose something totally, totally separate non-medicine. Um, everyone has to find their own path, but ideally they are finding a vocation and not a job. 
Dr. Mark Courtney, what an astonishing evening we've had. I, it was just so wonderful. I'm going to ask all 500 people out on chat to please put thank you, Dr. Courtney, out in chat just so you can see <laughs> the abundance of the gratitude uh, for the students that were with us tonight. Um, it is so important for us to learn from people who've been around the block for a while. Um, we have all had our stresses and strains. We've all had moments there where clarity was not necessarily there for us. And to have the opportunity to, to be able to be around people who've managed to find their path through this very complicated thing called life and medicine is exceptionally valuable to our team. Thanks to the virtual shadowing team. Rachel, thank you for um, uh, heading this up tonight and for putting this together. Mark, thanks for doing a wonderful job on those slides. And so to all those out there, uh, we will keep being here as long as you keep coming back. We've got a wonderful talk from an emergency physician, a wilderness medicine person next week. And I've already been in correspondence with her and we, we have a very exciting time planned for you. So Mark, again, thank you so much. Uh, Gil and Brandon, thank you, the whole virtual shadowing team and to all of you on the website tonight who are with us. Thank you for coming. We look forward to seeing you again next week and have a wonderful evening and have a wonderful holiday. Thank you and good night. Thank you very much. My pleasure. Take care. Uh, before you hang up, uh, can you go to the next slide about the assessment? <laughs> yeah, you bet. All right. So this is the um, upcoming assessment. You do not need a QuestBase account. All you need to do is enter in the pin with the dashes and find the assessment. Um, and then enter in the password. There are no caps uh, or um, spaces in the password. And you have until next Tuesday at 6.59 p.m. Central Standard Time to complete uh, assessment number 30. Assessment number 29 is going to be still due this Thursday at uh, uh, 6.59 p.m. Central Standard Time. Um, all the articles that were mentioned tonight um, and in the chat will be put into the interesting finds Google Doc and all that Google Doc and Google Drive is found at the bottom of your emails and we will also send it out in tomorrow's email as well. But thank you for joining us tonight. This was so inspirational, Dr. Courtney, to all of our students and there, there's so much love for you uh, in the chat and everyone's very appreciative of you addressing this very serious and important topic. So thank you for your time.